everybody, and welcome once again to the Images in Focus show. And Juan Pons, and with me as always is my good friend, uh, David Swindler. How are you doing, David? Doing great. Excited well, to do this next episode with you, Juan. Excellent. Me too. I always enjoy doing these, these shows. Uh, well, folks, in this episode, we're going to be talking about techniques to use for creating landscape images with impact. These are not our top techniques. They're just a series of techniques. We have 10 to share with you guys and possibly in a in separate episode, we may include some more, but why don't we get right to it? Um, why don't you start us off, David? Okay. So I'd like to talk about the first technique, which is light. And the word photography literally means writing with light. And if you don't have good or compelling light, it's really difficult to make a landscape photo that has wow factor. And it's so important that we pay attention to the direction of the light. And I often tell my clients, if you can see your shadow in front of you, that's typically not a good direction to shoot. Because when you have light coming from behind, it washes out the scene. You don't have that nice shadow and contrast and things that lend depth and dimensionality to the landscape. Instead, I try to look for things like side light and or backlight. So this first image I'm going to share with you is taken on a recent workshop. And we had to get up really early to catch this early morning light. You know, we were out the door at 4 a.m., and ready to shoot at 5 a.m. as soon as that sun came up. And we wanted to get that first light as it came over because that first light always has that rich warmth to it. And it, it just adds so much um, depth and dimension to the shot. And because the light was coming up to the side of me, that's how we're creating all these nice shadows and contours and textures. And as you can see in this shot, you know, the light starts down here and it draws my eye into the frame and it kind of follows these different spotlights that we have throughout the image. And of course, my subject here is this little farm off in the distance. But then we still have some nice light back behind it, too, that really shows you the depth of this really green pastoral landscape. So side light is definitely one of my favorites to shoot. But I think my all time favorite, though, has to be backlight. And here's an image from uh, our Iceland workshop this last winter. And when we first arrived at the scene, it was so windy. You know, we were probably gusts of 40 miles an hour. The waves were huge. They were crashing onto the shore. It was very atmospheric, uh, but there was no light. It was completely clouded in, and it didn't look like we were going to get much in the way of a sunset shoot. But then... All of a sudden, a small hole started to open up in the sky, and for about two minutes there, the sun broke through and lit up these crashing waves as they were coming in towards us. And that made for a really interesting shot because by shooting the backlight, um, I was able to get the highlights coming off the tips of these waves, and then that naturally would lead my eye in towards the sun as it's setting in the background. But then we've got incredible silhouetting going on with these rock uh, sea stack formations. And that contrast really adds an extra level of excitement to the image. And that's what really creates the mood. You know, as photographers, we're all about creating mood. And I use light as my means of creating that mood. And backlight is one of the best ways to add uh, a, an interesting mood to your image, whether you want to bring out the nice highlights or you want to bring out dramatic shadows and contrast. It all depends on what you're after. But without that light, it's so hard to create an image that will speak to people. Uh, another type of light I like to use. Well, you know, David, be, before before you keep going, um, you know, a well, comment I want to make is that you said something at the very beginning there that's really important. A lot of people, you, you talked about if you the light is coming in from behind you and you would see the shadow in front of you, you know, that's not the best light. And we oftentimes hear from a lot of people that that is the best light. And I kind of shake my head <laughs> too. And I guess, you know, I guess to be fair, it depends on the situation, right? For landscapes the side light or the backlight it just pr provides a much more dramatic effect than having that oh, yes. straight light onto to the scene right um mm -hmm. and it like you said creates those shadows too and the shadows provides that depth and dimension to the scene 
if you have that back, you know, that light coming in from behind you right onto the scene, you're not going to get those shadows. The shadows are going to be behind those subjects. So you're, it's just going to be kind of flat. So I, I think that's oh, yeah. really important to emphasize because, you know, you, you kind of mentioned it and then um, – I want that to sink in with people because I think that's probably, you know, out of all the things we're going to talk about, you know, for landscape, that's one of the, if not probably the most important thing to talk about. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there's exceptions to that rule. There always are exceptions. Right. You know, if you want to capture like a shadow selfie, then, yeah, having your shadow in the shot can be kind of cool. Or if you're trying to get that rainbow, then, yeah, you're going to have to shoot with the light behind you. But most of the time, in fact, the majority of the time, I never shoot with the sun behind me because of that exact reason. I have no depth or dimension to that landscape. All the shadows are gone. And right. it just looks very two-dimensional. I don't like that. Yeah, the colors are really rich and vibrant, but that's the only thing that's really going for me shooting in that particular direction. Instead, I find I can get so much more depth and interest in the shot by shooting with side light or backlight. I Back mean, and, and a lot more drama as well, right? I mean, that's where you're going to oh, yeah. get that drama from that light and those shadows. Yeah, very much, very much so. And, you know, that's why backlight is one of is personally my favorite because you can create so much drama with that technique. Now, shooting with the backlight is the most difficult. Right. You know, you're often having to bracket or you may have to worry about sun flare and other things, but the extra time and effort you pay to correcting those things will pay dividends down the road i mean that's when that dynamic range is going to be super important you know making sure that you oh, get yeah. detail in those shadows as well as detail in those highlights as well exactly okay mm -hmm. so why don't you keep going sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but i thought that point was really important i wanted to emphasize that well thank you Juan. another type of light that i really enjoy shooting is reflected light and that uh is something that you see more in like slot canyons for example and so here, you know, this light that you see on this back wall here, this is not direct sunlight hitting the canyon. Instead, it's light that's hitting a higher wall of the canyon and reflecting down in. And because of that, it has a really rich uh, uh, quality to it, really nice color to it. And it's also within the dynamic range of the camera sensor. Camera sensors eat this kind of light up because you can shoot it without having to bracket and do all that crazy stuff. Uh, because it's the right kind of light. And you can see this light is bouncing off this wall and lighting up the wet mud up in front of me. And this is another technique I often will use with my landscape photos, is I try to find areas where the light is hitting my foreground and creating some additional interest in dimension. And you can see here we got this light reflecting off this mud, which in addition to the mud cracks, it draws the viewer's eye right into the image, and it gives that three-dimensional aspect to the photo. And another technique I like to use with light is I try to put important highlights in, in towards the back of my image. The reason why is that the eye will always kind of follow the light and try to follow it to the brightest parts of the image. So if you can plan a shot out where you can put these bright highlights towards the back of the image, then it allows the eye to travel naturally through the image and follow that light uh, back to where it's at. Now, the other thing that oh. I think is important, you talked about um, the, the direction of the light or the position of the light, but there's also quality of the light, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, you know, if you have harsh midday light, it can be really hard to work with. But if you have that nice, soft, reflected light coming in, the camera loves to work with that. And so oftentimes light that may look less impressive to your own eyes will look better on the camera. Right. And light that looks amazing to your own eyes, you take a picture of it, the camera just can't record that dynamic range, that may not be the best light to shoot. And in a previous episode, we talked about mirrorless cameras and what you see is what you get. Well, that's a big advantage of mirrorless cameras is it allows me to see as the camera sees uh, within the dynamic range of the camera sensor. And it helps me capture images that are more applicable to what the camera can actually capture. Right. I mean, and, and, and that goes back. I mean, it's going to, you know, there, all these things that we're talking about overlap, you know, some of these techniques that we're talking about, right? Because, oh, yeah. you know, if you want that good, good quality of light, which you're going to get when the light is nice and low, 
you know, you're going to be up early so when, the, when the sun is just rising or when it's setting late in the afternoon, you know, unless you're down in the extreme ends of the, of the globe. Then sometimes the light can be sweet all day long. Um, oh, yeah. So, awesome. so, so yeah, the direction of the light is super important, but it's also the quality of the light. So. Exactly. And, it, and along those same lines, you know, shooting at midday is often not something I tend to do. But there's always exceptions to that rule. You know, here's an example of a shot I took right at midday. And, you know, it worked because the sun was coming through and really highlighting these bright uh, spring green leaves of this tree. And I had a dark cliff back behind it. And this was a single exposure shot, you know, just within, within the dynamic range of the camera. And it really made this tree pop. And this is a technique I'll often use with fall colors too. Sometimes shooting in the midday light really can make those fall colors come alive and pop in ways that they otherwise won't. But then the other kind of light I really like is spotlighting. And when you have like that partly cloudy day and you got like a beam of light coming out and just hitting uh, a particular subject, I love to uh, take photos of that and to kind of isolate those subjects. Uh, this is an example from uh, a little grouping of trees out in Mongolia. Um, it was a partly cloudy day. The light happened to come out perfectly, hit this little grouping of trees. I got out my telephoto lens, shot this at 400 millimeters. And, you know, having that dark uh, hill back behind and the lighted trees up in front really brought, brought the image to life. Yeah, very and cool. And the final type of... I do like that that spotlighting. You see that, um, you know, actually where, where you and I were in Yellowstone when you're coming into Lamar Valley and you got the cottonwoods out in the open. I love when the clouds are coming in and just spotlighting those trees. So it can be, oh, yeah. if you're lucky enough to be in a location uh, where that is happening and you have the right subject, it can be an absolutely beautiful and very dramatic scene. Oh, absolutely. And if you have like fast moving clouds and light popping in and out, it's often worth just waiting for a while to see what happens. Right. And you might wait for an hour, and then all of a sudden that perfect spotlight will hit right where you want it, and you just got to be ready and waiting. Right, right, absolutely. Okay, you had one yeah, more image, last, right? Yeah, the last type of light I was going to talk about is using uh, blue hour and artificial light. And so blue hour is, the, is a perfect time to shoot places like cities, for example, because you're going to get that really nice blue sky back behind and then the city lights are just starting to turn on. Here's an example more from a landscape perspective. This is also kind of uh, getting into the blue hour here. And we had snowshoot up to this ridge and, you know, I didn't expect this at all, but there's this low fog that was rolling in and the ski resorts had just started to turn on their lights for night skiing. And this underneath this fog, you know, the, the ski resort light uh, lit up the bottom of the fog so nicely. And you can see the light kind of coming through. So in this case, you kind of looks like a like a river of lava or something rolling through this valley. And it made a really neat effect. So don't discount artificial light either. I use that whenever I can to good effect in my in my landscape photography. You know, one of the scenes, I love the fact that you have both the cold and the warm light in that same scene. And, you know, there's a lot of landscapes, some of my most favorite landscape images with it are doing the blow hour where you get some warm light, you know, sweeping in either from the last remnants of the sun or from artificial lighting, like you're, like you're saying there. That is, that is pretty cool, the fact that that's that that um, lighting coming in from the bottom on those clouds, on those low-lying clouds, that's pretty, really cool. I love that. Yeah, and, you know, what you say is so true. You know, when you have that warm to cool yeah. uh, color contrast in the image, it just creates such a nice contrast that really engages the viewer's eye. Yeah, I mean, I love and, it also when you have it, like, the blue on one side and the warm on the other side, it almost gives you, like, a sense of progression of the day or the sun as it's moving across the landscape. Yeah, and I was able to kind of accomplish that in this image by using a panoramic type technique. So I took this as like five vertical shots all the way across, one, two, three, four, five, and I stitched those together in post-processing. Very cool, I love that image, very, very nice. Oh, well, thank you, Juan. So how about you tell us about the next technique? Well, the next technique that I'm gonna talk about is um, layering. And um, you've 
a lot of people may have heard this that layering is super important when you're shooting um, landscape um, photography because it adds to the sense of depth and dimension. We talked about how the light does that and making sure that your light is coming in from the you know, from angles from the left or to the right so that you do or or even backlit so that you do get that dramatic light but being able to layer your images um, can add a lot more sense of depth and dimension onto your scene and also can add a lot more interest um, to the scene as well like for this example here this is in uh, schwabacher landing in uh, the grand teton national park very, very famous in the well photographed location because you got this little, um, a little bit of river, if you will, or a stream really, that in the morning is perfectly still and you get the Grand Tetons reflected on the water like you see in this image. And, you know, a lot of folks, when they go out here, one of the things that they do or they complain about, and you can see this when you go there, the, the near bank of the stream where you're at is covered with these grasses and a lot of folks kind of like tamp down the grasses or they cut down the grasses to be able to get the reflection of the water and the uh, mountains in the background well i prefer to actually use those in my scene as opposed to completely take them out because it adds another sense of dimension and here in this image you can see that we have a foreground which is those grasses in in the in the foreground, right in the right bottom right hand side of the image, you have the reflection, which serves as kind of my, my middle ground, as, as well as the, the far shore of that stream. And then you got the Grand Tetons in the background as your background part of the scene. So ha having that layering effect, you know, gives you that sense of depth and dimension, gives you a sense of of you being immersed in the scene, you standing there and being able to look across this sort of vast landscape. It's not like you're, you know, um, you're looking at a scene that's completely flat. And obviously compounding this technique with um, the, the direction of the light, like David was talking about, can add even a deeper sense of depth and dimension onto, onto the scene. A lot of the techniques that we're going to talk about, you know, there are things that you don't need necessarily look in in isolation, but you apply them one on top of the other to um, to achieve a, a, an image that has that much more impact. Yeah, and in fact, the more techniques you can include in one image, oftentimes the stronger that image will be. That's right. You know, it's not like you know when you're when you're doing something in uh, desktop publishing where you add a lot of different fonts, and the more fonts you add, the the, <laughs> the crazier the the scene looks. Here, the more of these techniques that you're able to apply, oftentimes it makes an even stronger image. The the thing is, you know, of some of these techniques, they you know they don't necessarily play well with one another. So, um, but some of them do, and if you can apply them together, that's an even better better result. Okay, so let's take a look at here in another scene. Um, and this is actually near uh, near where you are right now. This is in Mount Rainier, Reflection Lakes in Mount Rainier. I'm a kind of sucker for reflection, especially on uh, of bodies of water that are perfectly, perfectly still. Um, in this image, I think, you know, I've been here many, many times, and I can't remember when this particular image I took. Uh, whether it was could have been last year, could have been ten years ago, could have been fifteen years ago. I don't know. I've been been out there many, many times. And here again, we have a sense of layering. We have multiple layers here, not just a foreground and a and a middle ground and a background. We have multiples of foreground layers. We have all these beautiful pink flowers in the foreground. We have some of the small conifers that are on the near shore of the water. We have the reflection of the mountain itself on in the, in the middle ground. We have some conifers on the far shore. And then in the end, we have the uh, Mount Rainier with a thin layer of clouds, you know, kind of halfway up the mountain, providing, you know, again, that nice sense of depth and dimension. It doesn't provide, you know, it doesn't show a completely flat image. So the more that you can arrange these elements, um, I think the more effective technique can be. However, you have to be careful. If you've noticed in the previous image, as well as this image, and I'll go back to the previous image here real quick, look at the way that these layers are interacting with each other. Um, I'm making sure that I'm trying to keep uh, 
separation as much as I can between those layers. So, for example, in the image of Strawbacher Landing, those grasses in the foreground kind of fill in a niche or what would have been a negative space in the reflection of the water. They kind of fit that contour right on the lower right-hand side of the image. You can see that there. Um, if you look at um, the next image of Mount Rainier, same thing with the uh, the framing of the foreground elements. You'll have the foreground kind of coming in and filling in that negative space in the water, the reflection in the water, but still allowing enough room for that reflection of the mountain to show up. On the right-hand side, that, uh, the, those, those, uh, that vegetation that's on the right-hand side, again, kind of framing the image, not imposing onto our main subject of the scene. Now, the thing here is, is that we want that main subject of ours to still be prominent, right? And to be kind of our, still be our protagonist or, you know, our star of the scene. Well, you have all these other supporting actors kind of playing a role of adding, you know, eye candy, if you will, or adding a sense of place, a sense of uh, a feeling, um, or even if it's just a splash of color, which certainly these, these flowers in the foreground are doing in this, in this scene. <clears throat> And then I have a, a, a third one here, um, which is this image I took in uh, Scotland. Um, this is um, what they call the the uh, the buckle, the because the the name I can't pronounce the, correctly the name of this mountain, but it starts with buckle, um, and it's an amazingly beautiful mountain, very conical, and the foreground is completely uh, in this case full of moving water and we have water that's moving in a lot of different directions we have smaller cascades we have some flowing water we have swirls of water including some beautiful fall vegetation in the middle ground and the background again providing multiple points of interest can um can add to the scene here it's even compounded by the fact that the top of the mountain is part of it is a uh, um uh obscured by some low-hanging clouds, which is something that you run into in Scotland 95% of the time. The skies, you know, are usually very, very cloudy and kind of moody, especially in the fall, which is when this image was taken. Um, and you can see here that I have multiple elements in the scene that, you know, you could say, in a way, can be our primary actors. You know, there's some in the, in the foreground, some in the middle ground, and some in the background but they're not really competing with each other. They're kind of supporting each other, which is really important when you're trying to apply that, that sense of layering onto the scene. So think about that. You know, how can you compose the image by including those layers in the scene to support your, primar your primary subject in the scene while, without detracting from it? You want those secondary actors to be supporting your primary actor, not detracting from it. Okay, David, why don't we go on to your next uh, technique? So my next technique is called Know Your Location. And obviously, if this is a location that you've been to many times, then you kind of know how the light changes throughout the year, when it's going to be best, where the best foreground locations are going to be, and where to get the best shots. But the challenge can often lie where we arrive at a location at the without really knowing it, and we try to create a good photo out of it. And in order to do that, you know, you're going to have to do some homework and planning ahead of time. And the example I wanted to bring up was this church down in Mexico. And I knew I had wanted to capture this church uh, with the looming volcano back behind it. And I thought ahead of time, oh, it can't be that difficult. You know, I can go find a spot, line everything up and take the shot. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, but you know, I decided, you know what, maybe I need a little time to kind of figure this out. So I made sure I arrived plenty early. In fact, we arrived the morning uh, that day so I could have several hours to kind of scout out. Well, I quickly realized in driving around, looking around at different places, that it was very difficult to find a clean composition where I wasn't going to get like telephone poles and wires and buildings and trees and other things sticking up into my shot. And I eventually found this pedestrian bridge going over the interstate. And somebody had cut a hole in the top of this bridge where you could climb through the 
wire and stand up on top of this bridge. It was a very scary place to shoot. And it was the only spot I could find where I could get this church next to the volcano. But the problem is there are some trees over to this side, and it still wasn't really the shot I was after. I was hoping to get a wider shot of everything going on. And I thought, well, you know what? This might be the best I can do. You know, if anyone walked over the bridge, it would vibrate. You know, it really was not an ideal place to, to be doing photography. And so I found this building, and I was looking up wistfully at this building. I was like, man, if I could just get up on top of that building, that would be the perfect place. But there's like no way to get up there. You know, the doors are locked. There's no one around. And just as I was leaving, we saw a guy walking towards the building, and he was starting to unlock the door. So we called out to him in Spanish and ran over there. He acted kind of surprised, like, what are you guys doing? And we told him what we were after. And he's like, oh, yeah, if you guys want to come back at sunset, I'll gladly let you up, and you can go up to the rooftop of the building and, wow, that's and awesome. take some photos. And so, you know, by having done the homework and, and you know, looked around and found – finding good options, we were able to get up on top of the building. We had a great sunset. The lights just started coming on in the church, had some color in the sky. And because I didn't have this tree over here, you know, I was able to take a nice panoramic image all the way across and capture it just the way I wanted. Very and cool. so, yeah, knowing your location is super important. You know, you got to put in the time and effort to figure out how you're going to get that uh, great shot, that great vantage point and be there for the best light. Well, it, it's also you know, not just knowing the location is, you know, kind of persevering, right? And in, in not taking no for an answer, so to speak, which is what you did here. I mean, you couldn't make it, you, you couldn't get it from where you wanted to. So you kept exploring until, and then even went out and found somebody to let you into the, lo to, to the what you thought was the optimal location that, that worked out. So you worked for that image. <laughs> Oh yeah, Some, sometimes yeah, and sometimes you just have to get lucky too, and it may not work out the first time you go. Sometimes you have to go back more than one time. And the other thing I'll talk about with like knowing the location is also knowing how it changes throughout the seasons of the year. Right. And Juan and I we're going to be leading a workshop in October in Southern Utah focused on fall colors, and fall colors can be a fickle thing. Sometimes it happens right <laughs> on schedule. Sometimes it's two weeks yeah. early. Sometimes it's two weeks late. And by knowing a location, you know, okay, if the colors aren't good in this area, could they be good at a lower elevation? Right. Or could they be good at a higher elevation? And you know exactly where to go in case things don't work out according to plan. Well, I mean, and that's and so, really what you're paying for when you go on a workshop is, you know, because you have somebody that knows the location intimately. At least that's what you're you hope for right is that's what you're always looking for in a leader someone that knows the location intimately because like you said if it doesn't work or the weather is bad you're gonna have alternate locations so you don't you don't uh, uh waste your time absolutely and so going with that local expert or that local guide can really pay right. dividends absolutely all right Juan. how about you go on to the next technique Okay, well, the next technique is plan and prepare, which is actually similar to what you're talking about in a lot of ways. Um, there are multiple ways in which you, could, you can interpret this plan and prepare in that you got to make sure you have the right gear with you when you go to a particular location, the right gear for that particular location, but also, um, you know, understanding uh, the uh, what the weather is going to be like, where the sun is going to be, you know, what time of the day the sunset or the sunrise is going to going to uh, going to go down or come up, where the sun is going to be in relation to the subjects that you're photographing. I mean, all these things are very important. You got to plan ahead, and it kind of reminds me of the picture that you showed in a previous episode of the um, uh, Seattle Space Needle, right? You had to plan like crazy to make sure that you got the moon right by the space needle you had to you know prepare research you know or not um to make sure that you get the image and uh, the image i'm going to show here real quick is um an image that i took in sri lanka um this is a location that a lot of folks go to photograph these are the fishermen on stilts but you know i want a specific look to the image you know and i had to basically plan the shoot that I was going to make when I, when I was there. And I wanted to make sure that it was right at sunset as the sun is coming down because that's where the sun was going to be. I wanted the, the, um, 
uh, my fisherman in the foreground to be silhouetted and with the sun just falling right behind him with this beautiful water in in our foreground and in order to do that i had to scout out the location i had to prepare the shoot i had to envision the shoot ahead of time um, and make sure that these guys were going to be there for me to execute the photograph flawlessly this was what i was leading a workshop and obviously having that plan and preparing for that plan to or preparing to make the images to make sure that all of the elements fall in line is incredibly important yeah sometimes we get lucky and we can get a shot that is absolute you know uh, uh, a grab shot because you happen to be the right place and the sun just lit up and but most of the time these you know the images are going to create the most impact of the ones that you've been planning and you've been preparing for to make sure that you're at the right place at the right time with the right gear okay david why don't you uh, take us to the next technique so the next technique is called perspective. And there's many ways to get or to change perspective in your photography. One of the most obvious ways is to shoot a variety of focal lengths. And so I want to run through a string of examples here at, from ultra wide angle all the way up to super telephoto, all from the same area to kind of show you how you can change your perspective and get totally different looking landscape images. So these are from the famous uh, dead trees over in Namibia. This first shot I took with my 11 millimeter lens. And I really wanted to highlight these roots that were coming out of this dry, cracked ground. In order to do that, I had to get up very close to this tree. I had to get down lower and I had to shoot extremely wide. So this is a wide 11 millimeter shot. And you can see it has a very different character than when I shoot more like a 28 millimeter focal length, which is how I shot this one. And for this shot, I, want, I didn't care so much about what was in the near foreground, which is why I wasn't shooting as wide, but I wanted to emphasize you know, the light and shadow contrast as this last light was kind of hitting the background dunes and this foreground tree was falling into shadow. Next, I got out a telephoto lens and I started compressing some of these trees back into the dunes that were back behind them. So you can see here at a wider focal length, the tree is sticking up into the sky. But if I back up and I shoot a more telephoto compressed focal length, then all of a sudden all I, I don't see any sky. All I see is the background dune being lit up by the sun. Next, I hiked up one of the dunes and I took out a 600 millimeter lens and I shot down into the trees. Again, here I don't see any sand dune. And the image came out of camera almost black and white. And so I did a final black and white conversion just to kind of accentuate uh, that mood I was after. But you can see by, you know, hiking up and getting a different perspective, it totally changes how these trees look like so. And then the final perspective I got here was from very high up in the air, an aerial perspective. And now it looks completely different. And you can kind of see the cool erosion patterns and textures in the landscape down below. And aerial perspectives can be very powerful. Here's another example of an aerial perspective. And looking down on these badlands in Utah, um, you can see all the cool lines, textures, and colors that you just can't appreciate from a ground level perspective. The last thing I'll mention with perspective is you want, if you can't find a good foreground, one of the techniques I'll often tell people to do is get down low. If you get down low, you can often find something interesting that you can include in your foreground, especially if you're shooting with a wider angle lens. And that was the case in this particular alcove. And now I was struggling to find a good way to include a foreground, but I saw these really neat shark tooth patterns on the ground. So I got down very low and I included those as the foreground of my composition. So with perspective, one of the techniques I'll leave you with is you need to look through your camera a lot. And so often my clients will go out and they'll just set up a tripod right at standing height and start taking photos. And I tell them, no, what you got to do is take that camera off the tripod, start looking around, get down low, get moved to the side, move to the other side, get down a little, get up higher, kind of see what really speaks to you as you're looking through that camera at the focal length you want to shoot it at. And then set up the tripod to that specification, to that point where you really 
find an engaging composition. You know, it's interesting because oftentimes we don't, um, you know, like you're saying, we may not find a the, the right uh, object to put in the foreground. And like you said, getting down low, one of the things you can do is find something that's there. But oftentimes, you know, I like to say that photography to me is a uh, exercise in subtraction. Basically subtract anything that's distracting in the image and simplify your scene as much as possible, right? Yes. Um, exactly. And oftentimes, by getting down low and changing your perspective, you can remove a lot of those distracting elements that may be in the scene. You know, getting down low will compress that foreground for you. And you may be able to use an, an element that's in the foreground to obscure an element that may be in the mid, in the, in the mid ground, so to speak, um, yep. and to simplify the image. So yeah, changing perspective. You know, how often have you run into people that are always shooting from a standing position? You know, to me, oh, that's just absolutely. <laughs> it's just crazy that people are doing that. It's like you know, I almost never shoot from a standing position. You know, I'm always looking to move up or down or left or right to try to come up with a little different perspective. Absolutely. Okay. Great one. Yep. So the next uh, uh, topic that we want to talk about is about guiding your viewer. And what I mean by that is trying to take your viewer on a journey as they are looking at an image. And oftentimes you can do this by including leading lines in the scene. And they may be, you know, pretty obvious leading lines like this one. This is... Um, the uh, uh, overlook of the Tetons National, uh, the Grand Tetons in the Grand Teton National Park, um, the Snake River in the foreground, the Snake River Overlook, a very famous photograph uh, made famous by Ansel Adams many, many years ago. And it's still a beautiful location to shoot at, especially when you have very dramatic clouds over the Tetons. And in this case, you have a river that serves as a guide for your viewer uh, to to get them to follow that river towards what you want them to look at, which is the mountains in the background. If we look at another scene here, here's another uh, uh, location, this one in Yellowstone in the winter, where the water, again, is serving as a guide for your viewer, kind of taking your viewer through a little journey, if you will, through the image and guiding them to different parts of the scene that you want them to look at. It's a way to kind of guide them and point them, kind of say, hey, this is the subject that I want you to look at to make the image as obvious as possible. Um, so try to find elements in the scene, you know, and they could be as obvious as this. It could be as obvious as a stream or a river in the foreground that's leading that the viewer to the parts of the scene that you want to see. You don't want them to miss any part of that, of that scene. And they can take them in a zigzag across the scene, or you can take them straight directly to the subject you want them to look at. Um, you know, oftentimes, like you said earlier, you know, our eye follows the brightest part of the scene, but if everything is bright, they'll follow the lines as well, which may be dark. Our, our brains are wired to follow those lines. So if you have those lines in the scene that, um, that can guide the viewer, it'll take the viewer on a journey. It'll allow you to control the narrative, if you will, or control the story behind the scene by taking your viewer through that journey. Okay, so yeah. what's our next technique, David? So our next technique involves weather. And as a landscape photographer, you need to get good at looking at weather forecasts and being able to kind of know when to go out and shoot. There are some days when it's just not worth going out and shooting. And there's other days when you will actually have a pretty good chance that you might have that amazing sunset or that amazing sunrise or get some lightning or when the northern lights might be active, so on and so forth. And so honing those skills and knowing how to do weather forecasting will really pay off. And in fact, that might be something we include in a future episode of Images in Focus. And we'll go into some of those techniques in more detail. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, And, in the, the, and the tools that we use as well, right? Oh, that's yes, and all well. those different tools, yeah. Because for me, that, that's what really makes a big difference mm -hmm. is knowing how or when to go out and where to go in order to have the best chances of getting something amazing. Now, obviously, everything's a probability. Yeah, you might go out <laughs> and get nothing, even though it was predicted to be amazing. But the thing is, is you want to give yourself the best odds. And right. by doing that, then you will get lucky more often than if you don't do that planning ahead of time. And in the Southwest, one of my favorite uh, seasons to shoot in is the monsoon season. 
because that's when we get a lot of the big clouds that move in, the storms, the amazing light, the, the great sunsets, and so forth. And so I was out at White Pocket with some clients during monsoon season. They were time-lapse videographers. And they had gone and set up their cameras. They had the slider rails going and everything. And then this big storm moved in. And it started just pouring rain on us. And I asked the clients, like, are you worried about your cameras? They're like, nah, they'll be fine. But I thought, you know, their time-lapse shots would be ruined because I was like, there's no way with all this wind and rain that they're going to keep the water droplets off their lenses and so forth. But then the, the rain stopped and the light started to break through. And this is what we were treated to. These amazing clouds, the light coming through, some great landscapes. And I, it's hard to know which direction to shoot because this is what it looked like in one direction. This is what it looked like behind me. You know, big double rainbow going on. But the amazing thing is, they happened to pick the perfect spot to set up their time-lapse series because they didn't get a single drop on their lens. Uh, the wind was coming in from behind their cameras. And so everything ended up working out. But you know, you can't be afraid of bad weather. Bad weather is often when I get my best shots. Uh, you might get soaked in the rain, but then as soon as that rain's gone, you might get an amazing rainbow like this. Uh, another way that I shoot with weather in mind is by actually following and chasing the storms. And we do that on our storm chasing workshops. Uh, with the storm chasing, it's all about finding the weather pattern first and getting yourself either in front or beside the storm that you want to shoot. And then the foreground or the location is secondary. And that's the case here. You know, we followed this really cool storm and, and you know, we didn't have much, much of a foreground to shoot, but I found this little road leading off into the distance. And it ended up working well because the weather was so dramatic, that became the focal point of the photo, not necessarily what I had in my foreground. Now, there's other times when you'll just get lucky and you'll be at a place with an awesome foreground and you'll get great weather. And again, you know, just trying to time things according to the weather patterns will pay off. I, you know, I had looked at the weather forecast earlier the, this day and I was like, you know what? There's a good chance we're going to get some really great thunderstorms rolling through. So I made the effort to get out to the Grand Canyon. And then, of course, with things like Northern Lights, you know, you want to be, you need to be able to uh, forecast where, where skies are going to be clear, for example, and when the activity is going to be high. And then if you go out during those times when the activity is projected to be high and you have clear skies, the chances of capturing Aurora Borealis go way up. So Juan, how about you talk about the next technique? Absolutely. Okay. So the next technique that we're going to talk about is visual interest. And really what visual interest to me is, is including something extra in the scene. You may have, for example, an amazing location, an amazing light. Like, for example, I'm going to show in this image here. Um, this is, again, in Scotland when we had this beautiful landscape and these amazing rays coming in through the clouds. Now this was, I have to admit, this was kind of a lucky shot. We were driving from one location to another. And as soon as I saw this developing, you know, I kind of almost careened off the road to the side of the road to pull over so we could make this, this, uh, this image. And I did that on, uh, I stopped in the particular place because I knew of this farm that was in the foreground. So what, what we did was, as the, as the clouds were moving, because you know in these situations when you have heavily overcast skies, but you have some breaks in the clouds, and you know the sun is going to come streaming through those, and those clouds are oftentimes very fast moving. So you just got to wait for the right light to fall in the right location or the best location uh, within the specific uh, uh, landscape or frame that you're looking at. And in here we had this beautiful farm alongside one of the lakes, in, in Scotland, and we just waited for the light to move in such a way that the rays looked like they were falling right on top of that farm. And that, you know, if we took that farm off, it would still be a great image to have in here, you know, to, to have uh, uh, witnessed and photographed. But just having that farm, that visual interest, that point of interest in the scene elevates the image that much more. It gives you a lot more to look at. It gives you a lot more um, uh, uh, to, to see, and it may even add a little bit more emotion to the scene. 
So here's another image, and this was um, one year I decided, you know, I do, I've been doing these workshops in Yellowstone in the winter for uh, I don't know, 16 years or so, for a very long time, and one year I decided to um, take a few extra days and head up to Glacier National Park in the middle of winter, which is kind of unique, you know, because most of Glacier is closed. There's only very a little bit open that's open, just the road from the entrance to McDonald Law, uh, Lake Lodge. Um, that's the only part that's open that's plowed. The rest is not plowed. You can't go in. You can go in and snowshoe and uh, and or uh, ski. But really, if you're driving in, that's the only part of the park that's open. But, you know, there is the Lake McDonald with some incredible, beautiful backgrounds. And I know a couple of beaches on Lake McDonald have these incredibly beautiful multicolored pebbles just underneath uh, uh, underneath the water. And the water there tends to be in very beautiful crystal clear um, because a lot of it is glacial water coming down from 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 the glaciers in um, in Glacier National Park. So my focus here on this image, yes, it's the mountainous in the background that's no covered with the really dramatic skies. But what I did was I pointed my camera down and had the multicolored pebbles in the foreground as a very strong um visual interest to the scene so adding to the scene of the background and some people may actually argue that the main subject in this image is the pebbles with the amazing sky and background um being uh the sky and the mountain in the background being the secondary subjects but to me it's really more about the mountain and the sky with the pebbles in the foreground as a uh, as an, an additional um point of interest or or some other visual interest that makes the image that much more compelling you know these two subjects again you have to be careful that one is not you know dominating the other one that they kind of complement each other and this in this particular image it works because the pebbles while you see them really beautiful and colorful in the foreground they start kind of melding or merging into the water as you travel back into the scene to towards Okay, David, you want to talk about our next technique? Absolutely. Great images, Juan. Thanks for sharing. So the next technique I want to discuss is simplicity. And we've alluded to this on some previous images yes. as well. But most landscape photos just contain way too much information. There's too much going on. There's too much clutter. It's hard for the eye to be, find something it can really focus on and savor. And there's many techniques for creating simplicity within images. I'll touch on a few. One of my favorites is to use a telephoto lens for landscape compositions. So I was at this beautiful lake up in the mountains. All the large trees were a peak fall color, and it was beautiful. And my first inclination, of course, is to shoot a wider lens and try to get the whole lake with all these large trees all around it, get some sky with it, the whole nine yards. But, you know, it just wasn't working for me. It just was too chaotic. There's too much going on. My eye didn't know really what the subject was. And so I switched course. And I got out my telephoto lens, and I focused on one grouping of trees off in the distance that were kind of reflecting down in the lake. And I shot a panoramic sequence going across this way with my telephoto, and I found that I liked that so much more. You know, the, cut, the clutter was cut out. Uh, there was a clearly defined subject, and it was very engaging to the eye. Another technique is to use longer exposures. And this was a very chaotic scene, you know, with this flash flood, waters coming uh, through Havasupai Falls. And if I shot the, the shorter uh, shutter speeds, uh, everything down below here in the river was just broken up. It was just ripples and stuff everywhere. It just didn't really work for me. So I put on a much darker neutral density filter and I shot this at a 25 or 30 second exposure. And as soon as I did that, the, the, the chaos in the falls went away. Everything kind of smoothed out into a nice silky uh, stream. And also you could see the flow patterns much better down below and that also helped simplify my composition. So if you're having trouble simplifying a chaotic water scene, you know, using a longer exposure and investing in those neutral density filters can really help. Here's another example from, some, from a waterfall in Mexico. 
I was having also the same kind of issue here where, you know, I didn't like some of the chaotic movement in the water in my foreground. And so again, I did a much longer exposure here. It really smoothed things out and I was able to bring this stick in my foreground out as a very prominent foreground element without all the clutter around it. Uh, snow and fog can be incredible ways to add simplicity to a scene. And that's why I love shooting so much in foggy scenes, because the fog really helps hide a lot of stuff that would otherwise confuse the eye. And this is an example where we had both things going on. We had fog and snow. And, you know, the fog was able to kind of give me some framing. I used a telephoto lens to kind of simplify and compress the scene. And this is one of my all-time favorite shots that I've ever taken at Bryce Canyon as a result. And then for the final one I'll show you, this is an example from Coyote Buttes uh, in northern Arizona. And, you know, there's a lot going on around this particular formation known as the second wave. But by using the appropriate focal length and paying really close attention to how I frame this, I was able to get the dark cliff back behind it, and I didn't get any sky up above it because that would have been very distracting to the viewer. I didn't get any of the bushes and stuff that are over on the side here, and I didn't get any of the distracting elements on this side either. There's also a bush down below here that I framed it just above that bush. And by getting rid of all those competing elements of the scene, now I have a very simple composition that allows my eyes to focus right on these leading lines in the amazing light coming into the scene. So as a photographer, you always have to ask yourself, how can I cut the clutter? How can I simplify this scene? Sometimes you might have to go pick some grass that's in, in your foreground. Other times you might have to move some rocks that are kind of annoying or some fallen leaves that might be in your scene that you don't want. You know, it's worth your time to clean things up, find that perfect perspective and composition so that you have the simplest, cleanest uh, representation. Yeah, I mean, like we said earlier, to me, photography is a game of subtraction. It's trying to keep things as clean and as simple and as clear as possible. You don't want, the last thing you want is your viewer to be wondering, looking at your image and wondering what is it that this image is all about and they're looking at. You gotta simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, and you mentioned a lot of great techniques to, to accomplish that. Very cool. Okay. Well, our last technique here is uh, what I call manipulating time. And what it, manipulating time is really just playing a little bit with your, um, uh, your shutter speed in your camera. And this can mean uh, multiple different ways. It could mean that you have an extremely fast shutter speed. You know, in landscape, that's not as applicable as you, you, you may think. Um, but really, when we're talking about manipulating time for landscape, we're talking about extending time and doing long-term exposure. So um, here's a, one image I'm going to show. I'm going to show a couple images real quick because we're running out of time. Um, this is a waterfall on the back side of many glacier in Glacier National Park, one of my, you know, favorite locations in the fall to photograph because you have a lot of interesting rock formations in the foreground with the beautiful water coming in, as well as some trees that are changing color. And in this case, we got treated to some really dramatic, beautiful skies. Um, and by extending that or having that long shutter speed, we were able to make that water nice and silky and smooth like um, like David even showed before in a, a couple of images he just showed. Um, one of the tricks that I do when I'm shooting waterfalls is to keep my shutter speed, even though I'm doing a long um, shutter, you know, sometimes half a second, sometimes a second, I try to keep it as short as possible. I don't want it to be too, too long because if you shoot water with um, a shutter speed that's too long, what happens is you start losing texture and the water becomes kind of a white blob. You want to capture that sense of motion, but at the same time, you still want to maintain some sense of texture and direction in that water. Now, um, the second image I'm going to show here, if I can advance my camera, 
is another water. But in this case, there's two things going on here in which I did a, a long exposure. I have the waterfall in the background as it's cascading over these rocks, but I also have an eddy in the foreground that's going around in circles. And you know, for this kind of image, you gotta shoot a much longer exposure, probably about a second, maybe two seconds, sometimes even 10 seconds to be able to capture that motion nicely in the scene. And it makes it for a very interesting um, and sometimes even kind of surreal image to have that water in the foreground that's circling around and swirling in an eddy and the water in the background. So manipulating time will give you another tool that you can use to add some interest to the scene. The last one I'm going to show, I showed two images of water and I'm going to show you another one with some clouds. Um, this is another technique that you can use. Um, with clouds to add some interest to the scene. In this case, again, in, Nash in Glacier National Park, um, I did a very long exposure. I think I had to use a 10-stop neutral density filter in this case to get about a 5 to 10 second, or maybe even longer, or maybe it's 30 second exposure to get those clouds nice streaking across the sky. Now, this works well when you have really cool textures you know, or very textured clouds. If you have kind of an overcast day, that's not going to work all that well. You want that nice textured um, sky so that those clouds look like they're moving in towards you and kind of racing towards you. And that is another technique that you can use to add some more interest to your landscape images. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing those great examples, Juan. Um, everyone, this, uh, this concludes our video on how to create landscape images with impact and how to really guide the eye. And um, I hope we, we hope you found these techniques to be useful and things that you can think about when you're out in the field and shooting. Um, as always, make sure you subscribe and hop on over to Facebook and join our Images and Focus group over there. It's also a great place to engage with other listeners of the episode and to suggest future topics for us to discuss. Anyhow, this is all we have for you today, and we can't wait for our next video. Absolutely, guys. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Again, if you enjoy this and you found this information useful, we encourage you to subscribe on YouTube by uh, clicking on the subscribe button. And also, if you click on that little bell, you will also get notified by YouTube when we upload a new video. We're releasing videos about twice a month. We don't have a set schedule, but we'll see two of these videos twice a month. Okay, folks, take care, and until next time, happy shooting.